I'm gonna now request uh, Sierra Boyne um, to come over here, address you all. Uh, she just graduated high school, Westview High School, right here uh, you know, in our neighborhood, the neck of our roots. And um, Sierra Boyne, it's you. The floor is yours. Gonna be a little bit elementary school right now. Can everybody clap once if you can hear me? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, well, my name is Sierra, and I'd first like to start off by saying that I appreciate every single one of you for participating today. I appreciate that you're here. I appreciate that you are here to hear me. And before I start talking, because I don't really like when I give speeches like this, I don't really like to write them out or script them. I, I much more appreciate a conversation. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a conversation with you all today. So before I do that, I'd like to ask a few things of you. I'd like to ask you to be open because this and my life and the things that I will share with you are gonna be hard, especially those of you here with kiddos and that's a lot, quite a few. This is gonna be difficult. So I'm asking you to be open. I'm asking you to be vulnerable and I'm asking you to feel with me because these are things that I have to do every day. So I'm asking you to make an honest and purposeful choice to do this, all right? Yeah. All right. So in, in, in the traditional black fashion, when we try to teach people things, we start generally, we are, we are storytelling people. So I'm gonna tell some stories, all right? The first time I was called the N-word, I was three years old. That was in preschool. It was another little kid, my age. And um, when people found out that that happened, they got very angry at this little kid, which I will talk about in a little bit. But um, my father, who is not black, he is white, he pulled this kid aside and he said, now why did you say that? And this child's response was, that's just what we call black people. I tell this story because it's important, especially those of you with children, that racism starts early and anti-racism needs to start equally as early because parents of black children don't have choices. We have to start this early. I've had conversations about race since I've been able to talk. And you have to do the exact same thing with your children regardless of their race because anti-racism needs to start as early as racism. And racists start that teaching early. So your children need to be having these conversations like the conversations I have to have with my parents that I've been having since I was able to walk. Which means if your children are able to understand the difference between mean and nice, they are able to understand racism and you need to be talking about it. All right. When I was six years old, that was the first time I was told by somebody that I couldn't play with their children because I was black. I wasn't allowed to play with their children. I wasn't allowed to go to the birthday parties because of the color of my skin. When I was still in elementary school, I was called a mongrel. I was called an animal, I was called a dog. When my, when my father was in his 20s was the first time that he was called a race traitor for falling in love with my mother. When I was 14, I was sitting in a coffee shop with my friend. Two police officers walk in. They stare at me the entire time that they're in line to get coffee. They take their order, they sit down at a table, right diagonal to me. The one that is facing me stares at me the entire time until his order is called. When he gets up to get it, the other police officer turns around to continue to stare at me. At this point, I get nervous, but I've had conversations with my parents about this since I was able to talk, so I knew what to do. I put my hands up and I put them on the table. My friend starts to notice that I'm nervous, and so he suggests that we leave. So we get up, I stand up, and at the same time, I grab my bag. Would black children and black parents generally are taught not to do this. You stand up, then you grab something because police like to get aggressive and that's exactly what happened. So I stand up, I grab my bag and I have two guns pointed at me. Both of them, unholstered, safety off, pointed in my face. I am 14 years old, all right? Because I, um, I'm a little bit of a, a smart aleck, I look this officer in the eye, I raise my hands and I say, officer, do we have a problem? And he says, no. He never puts his gun back in his holster. He puts it on the table and he sits down and I walk away. When I was 16 and I was just starting to drive, I get followed home by a police officer. I live in the cul-de-sac, so when I pull into my driveway, he parks horizontally so that I can't get out. He sat there 
for 45 minutes. I could not get out of my car. He sat there for 45 minutes. That happened four more times before I turned 18. That happened here. The officers who pulled their guns on me were members of the Hillsborough Police Bureau. That happened here. And I tell all of these stories because you have children, but this is what I have to go through every single day of my life. I am in danger because of my skin every single day of my life. And you know what? I see a lot of sad faces, but these are the good stories, and I'm going to tell you why. I went home. I got to go home. I got to see my parents that night. I got to go home those days. I got to go home. There are hundreds of black children, of black men and black women who cannot say the same thing. I am the best case scenario. My stories are the best case scenario. And I need other people to change that because I should be the worst case scenario, not the best. My experience is about as good as black parents can ask for, and that is the problem, and that is where we need other people to stand up. Because I cannot change the fact that that is the best case scenario for black children when they engage with police officers or with white people. I cannot change that, but you can, all right? And you can do that by doing a few things, and I'm gonna tell you this now, that I find that it's important if you are not black that you understand what your role is in every situation. And so I like to, it's about two steps, stepping back and then stepping up. When we are in spaces like this, that is your time to step back. That is not your time to do anything other than hear and feel with me. Because you need to hear me. You need to listen to me, to my experiences and what I'm telling you I need, what black people are telling you that they need. That is not your time to give an opinion because this statement on my shirt is not an opinion. This is not a political statement. This is a statement of fact. Black Lives Matter cannot be an opinion. It cannot be a political statement. And you and your actions determine whether or not I go home. Because that day in that coffee shop when two guns got pulled on me when I was 14, that was a full coffee shop. 45 people were in that shop. No one said a thing. Guns on a 14 year old. No one said anything. All right? When you put yourselves in between black people and the aggressors, I get to go home. And that is what I am asking for. I am asking for a commitment. You need to commit to anti-racism every day, which means that passive racism, thank you, yes. <laughs> passive racism, sly comments, strange things that you know are wrong or feel wrong cannot be let go because passive racism leads to active violence and it leads to the loss of black lives, which means you need to, when you are in your spaces, when you are in your homes, and when you are in with your children, then you need to step up. We need to be having these conversations, and I need you to feel uncomfortable. I need you to be actively uncomfortable, upset, and angry, and talkative. I need you to communicate, because when you communicate and when you act, you save my life. All right? Today is day 18 of protests in Portland, but we've been at this for a couple hundred years now. So I'm gonna need y'all to buckle up because this is a long ride and a long fight. So today you need to make a lifelong commitment to saving black lives. This means every day you hear us you listen to us, you actively reach out to us to see what you need to be doing, and then you do it, and you are going to fail, and that is so crucial. Failure in anti-racism is so important because you cannot grow unless you fail. You will be told that you are wrong. You will be told that you are doing something you are not supposed to be doing, and often that is met with discouragement, and it cannot be. Then you need to get even more angry, and you need to be better, all right? Because that is what we need. Because I'm out here, th th this skin is 24-7, so y'all need to be on the clock with me. All right? <laughs> and I appreciate every single one of you for being out here right now. And I hope that from here on out, you're going to be out there with me also. And you're going to be having these conversations. You're going to be talking. You're going to be stepping back, listening to black people, doing your research getting out there, you're going to be learning, you're going to be growing, you're going to be improving, you're going to be failing, and you're going to be being better. 
and you're gonna be saving black lives. In between the aggressor and me needs to be you or else I cannot go home. And I've been told that by my father since I was three years old, that you do everything you can to come home. That's it, that's the bare minimum is that I walk back into my house, which means that you need to be doing everything you can to make sure I go home. You need to remember what you're fighting for. The other day when I was painting a mural downtown, I had the opportunity to meet Oscar Hunter's children. I don't know if you remember the black man who was shot in his car by police in Vancouver last year, but that was Oscar Hunter. I got to meet his kids and watching his children play around a mural of their dead father, you need to, remi you need to remember, you need to actively remember what you are fighting for and that is black lives, black children, black men and women because they need to be the last ones and in between them is you. I'm asking for conversation, I'm asking you to step back and hear me, and then I'm asking you to step up and help me. And I'm asking you ultimately to save black lives. Thank you so much. See you at a point. Yay!